So for like a compound that's not biologically or chemically degraded, what was like the like average half life it has in the So how how fast does it change? Okay, um, well, it'd be fun to answer these questions ad nauseum and put you all to sleep. The water in Puget Sound gets connected back to the ocean on varying time scales. So the water near here that's flowing past Seattle, the surface water is going to um, flow out and get back to the ocean in anywhere from 10 to 30 days. The water in Hood Canal might take a year or two to get back out to the ocean. So in general, we're looking at a system that's going to flush itself in a couple of years or less. Any compound that stays in the water that long has a chance then to kind of be enhanced because it gets recycled around here. So things like metals, there's a lot of research that toxic metals that are put out into Puget Sound just stay in Puget Sound forever. They stick onto particles and they sink down into the mud and Puget Sound acts as a really good trap. For compounds like what we're looking at, they are also pretty sticky. So we're measuring things in the part per million or the part per billion level. And they have solubilities of tens or hundreds of part per million. If they start to accumulate more, what will happen to them is that they'll stick onto sediment and sink to the bottom of Puget Sound and they'll stay here if they're not degraded. But I think the short answer to your question is that almost all of the compounds we're looking at are going to have a, a lifetime in Puget Sound that's short enough that they won't probably build up for years and years and years. They'll be gone before then. So, um, there's actually two parts to my question. First of all, is it true that Victoria is still dumping raw sewage? And if they are, water currents being what they are, are we getting some of that raw sewage here in Puget Sound? How clean is our water? <laughs> All right. You would hope that Victoria would have stopped that, yes. but they don't. Victoria has a very um, sophisticated treatment system. They have uh, grates, and the grates are about this wide. So a dead cat can get out, but a dead dog will probably be caught by the grace. So it's pretty sophisticated, and that stuff gets out. We only have two or three samples from up that area, but they um, do see, we do see compounds there. That water is very, very diluted, and so it's certainly coming our way but it's being diluted with a great deal of other water before it comes our way, water coming down the Fraser River, water working its way uh, through the tides, through the Strait of Georgia. So I think the standard party line is that their sewage is gonna be so diluted by the time it gets down by us that, it, that it's just gonna get mixed in with our own sewage and we won't really, it's, it's not a significant contribution, but it is still happening. Um, I was wondering why artificial vanilla is ethyl vanilla, and I don't understand the, the, um, the logic of not synthesizing methyl vanilla instead. Right. Um, the question is why would we synthesize a fake compound when we could easily synthesize the real one? And the answer is that we do both. And so when we make real, when we make vanilla, we make vanillin, and when we, when we make vanillin from petroleum, we accidentally make ethyl vanilla, and the ratio there is about nine to one. So we make 90 parts of the regular stuff, and 10 parts of the stuff that's not natural. It just so happens, though, that the not natural component tastes to our tongues a lot more like vanilla than real vanilla does. It's kind of like NutraSweet is sweeter than sugar. So um, because, it's a, because it has such a great taste, or such a strong taste, there's a driver then to make more of that.
Uh, we were talking about the possibility that tall vanilla lattes were contributing to your data, and, and, and maybe all the cupcakes and the donuts around here. And well, well, anyway, it got us wondering why, why vanilla, why cinnamon, why not caffeine? Did you just take a few samples and find a whole bunch of vanilla and cinnamon? Or, or why did you choose those to highlight? Another good question. Keep running back here. Okay. Caffeine. First done. This, this is a great chance to tell the story of the lab. I inherited a lab from my mentor. I came to Seattle in 1991 and inherited a lab from a great man named John, John Hedges, who passed away a few years ago. And um, John was the instigator of the first caffeine measurements in Puget Sound, and one of our students now uh, works for the county. John had a great student who runs the pollutant program for USGS. John was an amazing man. John's legacy included a bunch of really fun things. Like we used to taste, we used to do chemical testing of wine. And we would tell you know, St. Michelle, you know, well, we need a whole case of wine, but we really only needed a thimbleful. And then we'd be sitting around and having a little bit of wine. And, but we would do all these measurements. And basically, the reason we're measuring the spices, vanillas, and cinnamons and things is because they're naturally found in woods and in other compounds that we use to reconstruct climate change. So this isn't the main focus of our research. It's kind of a side focus. And we already knew we could measure these compounds at extremely low levels with extremely high precision. So the reason we chased after them is simply because we already knew that we could. And it was the same reason we were tasting them and chemically sensing them in wine. We've used them to identify, help identify King Midas's tomb, which is a great story. We've looked at shipwrecks using the same compounds. You can tell whether a tree grew in Spain or up in France depending on these types of compounds extracted out of wood. So there's amazing and fun things you can do with chemistry in addition to looking at climate change, which is amazing and fun too. And so long-winded answer, it's kind of a serendipity that we could already make those measurements that, that brought us. And the reason we don't do caffeine now is because the county is already doing it. So there's not a real reason to be redundant about that. Um, you guys are specifically looking at water and there's certain compounds that you can no longer measure because they salt out and then you were also talking about stuff being sticky and uh, getting down in sediment. Um, is anyone in your team, maybe like a Google chemistry oceanography major or anyone else looking at what happens to that once it's at, not specifically in the water but it's actually gotten into the sediment and you know, what's happening to the compounds at that point or it's not like they just disappear? You want to come and work in our lab? <laughs> now, Brit Brittany's undergraduate thesis, Brittany's a double degree in oceanography and geology. And her thesis revol revolved around that exact problem. It comes out as a dissolved substance. It sticks onto a particle and sinks. And then flatfish and crabs and things are bioaccumulating certain types of compounds. So we have a wonderfully talented person who can do that. But our project hasn't gone that way. There are some amazing people here in Seattle, though, that do that type of work. Uh, there's a group uh, down at the Pacific Marine Environmental Lab near the University of Washington that's doing a lot of work with these compounds and, or, and other types of compounds once they get into the solid phase. So we're, just because we haven't gone that way doesn't mean other people aren't, aren't doing it. So I have a question. Um, it's been really fun for us to develop these kits, but it's also terrifying to stand up in front of the people that we're hoping would go to our website and request our kits. So I'm kind of curious if there are things that we could do or, or topics that we could address with our compounds that would help people want to be involved in the type of research that we're doing. And so um, I'm so amazed that you guys came. It would have been even uh, 
even more amazing if there were more of us here. And so what could we do with our program to help there to be more people the next time? season, you can hand out a lot of kits and get most of the late cover. That's a great idea. <laughs> and we're right down there. I, I couldn't I hear um, the statement over here, but it sounded like it was school related, but it's still getting students involved. And that, that, that sounds like a great, is that an avenue you pursued or no? Yeah. Yeah. Been to elementary and high school science classes and stuff like that. Left behind. <laughs> this this year we did fifth grades and high schools, and private schools too. Um, one private school and four public schools this year, and we've decided next year to to focus on high schools. And we're going to be in twelve high schools next year, and we're going to um, see how the fifth grade thing works out. But it's. It's amazingly hard to build a good teaching curriculum in a system where you have a Wassel exam and you have to learn this and you have to learn this. And learning about the environment is actually a very low priority for the, for the school system in Washington State. So we've teamed up with some amazing people who are trying to help us bring environmental sustainability learning into a full curriculum. So you learn a little bit about it in social studies and a little bit about it and our environmental ed class and things like that. And we're relying on experts at that to help us help us go that direction. I also think about, uh, just in the theme of school systems, uh, partnering with other people who need water samples. You guys are looking for one particular type of sample, but there's, I can imagine, several departments at the university, for example, that might be interested in uh, just whatever water someone could collect. And that's the sort of thing that can work into an integrated uh, curriculum instead of it needing to be your project needing a unit. Just, hey, we'll collect samples and then we'll send them off to you know all these different people who are interested in it. I, I grew up and went to school around here and I had several times where I was picking up water samples for University of Washington people and who knows what they were used for, but uh, by partnering with other departments, you can probably get a lot more uh, kind of interest in that. What if you recruited graduate students to mentor high school students to collect water samples where you could spread the word a little bit faster than simply a couple of people going around to different public schools? That's a great idea. The idea of having undergrads and graduate students mentor the high school students. The um, National Science Foundation funds programs like that, and the University of Washington has two right now, one of which is focused on marine science. So we're, we're only tangentially involved with that, but it's amazing, you're so right on how amazing it can be for somebody just a little bit older, but still maybe in the same generation, to go and interact. And there's a whole dynamic that happens when a 22-year-old is teaching a 17-year-old that just doesn't happen when a mid-40s guy with the long beard is standing up there. It's, just, it's so amazing to have the, these mentorship capabilities and possibilities. I know a bunch of men, a little 